Okay, take out your Bibles and turn to the book of Numbers, beginning, again, uh, beginning a new book tonight. So, Numbers, you can count on that. Okay. It's... That's pretty good. Doesn't always add up, does it? Don't subtract from this time. Okay. <laughs> really bad, huh? That good, means you're awake. That's a good sign. That's great. All right, so here you are. Let's, let's start with prayer. Lord, we ask that you would bless our study as we venture into a new book. Always uh, an anticipation of something new you might teach us as we're moving through the Bible. For some of us here tonight, maybe we've never studied through the book of Numbers. I mean, here we are. We're just in this fourth book of uh, the Pentateuch and these are not the, the books that we're always turning to. And yet, Lord, you have a purpose and a reason. You are calling your people to make them a nation, forming them. And so many things we learn as we see how you form the children of Israel because uh, these are the same principles in that you form us and call us and want us to trust in you and not lean upon our own understandings. And so the things that we learn uh, tonight and certainly in this book, we pray that we would um, grasp onto and that we would hear, we would listen, and we would seek to walk it in our lives. So bless our time in your word again tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Every uh, conscientious parent is always concerned about how they're raising their children, right? You're always thinking, I don't want to be so harsh on them that, you know, they lash back or whatever. And and I don't want to be too overbearing, and yet we don't want to be too gracious, right, so that they don't understand, you know, uh, authority and how they need to respect authority and so forth. So I, I was reading about this mother who wanted to have the last word, you know, just listen, this is the way it is kind of a thing. And yet she was arguing all day back and forth with her son. She couldn't handle the hassle anymore. She couldn't, she just... It couldn't handle it anymore, so she had an especially trying day, and she finally flung up her hands. You know, he was constantly being disobedient, disobedient to everything she said. So she finally flung up her hands in the air and said, Billy, do whatever you want. Just go ahead. Do whatever you want. Now see how you can disobey that one, right? Think about this. Do whatever you want and disobey that because, you know, the fact is we don't want to disobey that one. That's the one we want to do. But we all have this proclivity in our lives to be disobedient. We have to work on that in our children. And guess what? As adults, we have to work on that one all the time as well. We don't naturally want to obey. In fact, some people have a hard time even hearing that word. Oh, obey, right? I like what P.T. Forsythe said once. So he said, the first duty of every soul should not be to find its freedom, but to find its master. And our master is Jesus Christ. So now here we are in the Old Testament. We're thinking about how God is forming this nation. He took Israel. They were nothing but slaves in Egypt. He brought them out, of, out with his mighty hand to the wilderness, making them a great nation. He gave them possessions. I mean, they plundered the Egyptians, right? He gave them water from a rock. He gave them bread from heaven. Beyond that, in the last book we looked at, Leviticus 26, 12, God said, I'm going to walk in your midst. In other words, I'm going to be among you and I will be your God. Can it get any better than that? And yet we're going to see as we come now into the book of Numbers, they're going to complain. This is really now the book of complaint. They complain, they murmur, they grumble against God. So much so, and this is where we find it, that no one over the age of 20 is allowed to actually come into the promised land. The whole purpose for which God was now was calling them out and bringing them into this place of rest. So here we're dealing with a rebellious spirit. Now, a couple of things about this book. As I already mentioned, it's the fourth book in the five books of Moses, also called the Pentateuch. It was written somewhere between 1450 and 1405 B.C., and it gets its name, Numbers. Where does it get it from? Well, there are two numberings in this book, or literally two censuses taken, one at the beginning of the book and then one at the end of the book. And the whole purpose of the numbering is to organize and prepare the people so that they can now enter into the promised land. As I already said, though, they rebel. And as a result, the whole nation passes away in the wilderness before God has to raise up another generation who will then finally come into the land. 
So really, it's all about a book of spending time in the wilderness. In fact, uh, the word wilderness, we're going to read a lot about it. It's used 48 times in this book. Wilderness, wilderness, wilderness. Because that's where they're going to spend the majority of their time. In fact, the Hebrew title of this book is In the Wilderness. In the Wilderness. If you read in Hebrew, the title is In the Wilderness. It's taken from the first line of verse 1. So it's all about God's numberings of his people in the wilderness. How God deals with them how God numbers them, how eventually he gets them finally to the promised land. Now, there are actually four movements, or might say the book divides into four movements. You have the preparation for journey as you have the first numbering and then some other things attended to it. That's the first 10 chapters. Then you have the departure and then ultimately the demise of the nation, chapters 10 through 14. Then you have the wanderings. That's from chapter 15 all the way to chapter 25, just wilderness wandering. And then you have another preparation for the next generation to move into the promised land. And that's chapter 26 to the end of the book. Now, we're going to begin to look at the preparation now. And, of course, it was God's plan to bring them immediately into the land of promise. Of course, uh, we're going to see in future studies that they fail. But we're just going to look at the first four chapters tonight. A lot of numbering going on. So I'm going to try not to bore you. I hope it adds up to something good in the end. Let's say that. So now the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tabernacle of meeting on the first day of the second month in the second year after they'd come out of the land of Egypt. So notice second month, second year. Now, the book of Exodus encompassed, if you remember, exactly one full year. And the book of Leviticus literally encompassed one month. So it's literally been 13 months since they have left Egypt. They've received the laws. They received all the minute instructions concerning the sacrifices, all the feasts. They're now ready to go into the promised land. So God says, I need to take a census now of the people. Verse 2. By their families, by their father's houses, according to the number of their names, every male individually. By the way, later on when we get to the book of 2 Samuel, David is actually punished for taking a census. Isn't that interesting? God only wanted his people to be numbered when he said so for his purposes, not to number the people so he's like, oh, look how many people we have. Oh, wow, you know. And we tend to do that in churches, you know. I've fallen into Well, how many people came this week? How many people come that? And it's kind of like, oh, wow, look, you know. And God knows our tendency to do that. So he actually said, don't take a census unless I order it. And here it's ordered by God. Verse 3, from 20 years old and above. Notice, all who are able to go to war in Israel. You and Aaron shall number their, their, their armies. Notice, able to go to war. She was 14 times in this chapter. As Warren Wiersbe writes, the Genesis, if, if Genesis, the book of Genesis is the book of beginnings, and Exodus is the book of redemption, right? The, the Passover. Numbers is the book of warfare. And, and it really is. So this census is taken for the whole purpose of warfare. Because they're about to go into enemy territory. And God wants them to be prepared. He wants them to be organized, to possess the land. So all the males, 20 years and above. And by the way, this army was not made up then of volunteers, right? It wasn't at all. Every able-bodied male, 20 years and older. And it makes me think, you know, that you and I are an army as well. And God recruits all of us. From the moment you're saved, guess what? You're not, it's not a volunteer thing. I, well, I'm not so sure I want to be in the Lord's army. Too late. You're saved. You're in the Lord's army, right? And we're told in 2 Timothy 2, 3, that we need to endure hardship like a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Because we fight a good fight of faith. But we do need to be reminded that the Christian life is not a playground. It's a battlefield. And that's the truth. There's a real battle going on around us. And it doesn't take long to be a Christian to realize that, right? Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12 says, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's not a, a physical battle, but against principalities. These are demonic hosts, spiritual hosts in wicked places, rulers of the darkness of this age against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So we need to be prepared. By the way, by numbering all the men here, <clears throat> notice they were numbered all the men 20 and older, older uh, God wasn't implying here that they trust in their superior forces by knowing how many they have, but rather that they know what their resources are 
so that they can use them properly. We're going to see that God wanted them to be highly organized and immobilized. And I do think it's important that we know what our resources are as Christians as well. First of all, you need to know that you are more than conquer in Christ Jesus. I think far too often we're just, man, I'm never going to do anything. I can't do it. That is such a lie of the enemy. He wants you to feel like you have no resources. What a lie. You have all the resources of heaven at your disposal through Christ Jesus. You're more than a conqueror. Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ Jesus. Uh, you can do all things, not some, not most, not a few, all things through Christ who can strengthen you. So I think it's important for us to know all of our resources as well. Now, we're told as we move on that each tribe was to have a leader who would then add up the number of those in their particular tribe. Verse 4. And with you there shall be a man from every tribe, each one the head of his father's house. These are the names of the men who shall stand with you. And I'm not going to read it, but from verses 5 to 15, you have the names of those men who were the heads to do the counting. Verse 16, these were chosen from the congregation, leaders of their father's tribes, heads of the divisions in Israel. Then Moses and Aaron took these men who had been mentioned by name, and they assembled all the congregation together on the first day of the second month, and they recited their ancestry by families, by their father's houses, according to the numbers of names, from 20 years old and above, each one individually, as the Lord commanded. And from verse 20 now, all the way to down to verse 46, you have this census of these men. Um, and you might want to outline them. Maybe it's italicized in your Bible. You know, in verse 21, you have the tribe of Reuben. Uh, Simeon's in verse 23. Gad, verse 25. Judah, verse 27. Issachar, verse 29. Zebulun, 31. Ephraim, 33. Manasseh, verse 35. Benjamin, verse 37. Dan, in verse 39. Asher, verse 41. And Naphtali, verse 43. Now, I didn't read all the numbers because it's all totaled for us in verse 46. All who were numbered were 603,550. Now, it's been estimated with that many men, 20 and above, not including the Levites who haven't been counted up yet, with women and children, there would have been approximately two and a half to three million people. Talk about a massive undertaking for Moses, right? Some of you are supervisors. Some of you are managers at your company. I doubt any of you have even close to 3 million people under your care. I mean, more people, more problems, right? One person, one problem. You, right? I'm a problem. I can't even imagine myself. You know, it's like, stop it, Ron. Yes, I know. You know, anyway. And then you got groups of people. This is why I think Moses, when he was called in Exodus, said, Lord, you have the wrong person, right? It was a monumental task. But here's what I've found. When the task is so overwhelming, I usually have to trust in God because it's so big. It's so beyond me. I'll trust in God. True? Yeah. I mean, it's so big. And there are some things that are so big in my life. It's like um, my wife and I were talking to another couple about some situation. It's so big. It's out of my hand. I have to give it to God. What I have found is that the bigger problems are the smaller things. It's usually the small things that I think I've got that usually cause me the bigger problem. Oh, I got this one, God. Oh, I've been doing this for a long. Oh, I got that one. I don't need your help, God. And it's usually the smaller things that can trip us up. It's interesting, later on, when the children of Israel do come into the land of promise, we see this happen. Jericho is this overwhelming city, the first city they come through, and there's no way, it's walled like this, and then God says, I want you to do something ridiculous, march around it, you know. And it's so overwhelming, and God does this great thing. And they're like, God, you're so awesome. Well, then the next city they're supposed to take is the city of Ai. It's a very small city, and so the leaders come to Moses and say, oh, don't, or to Joshua, hey, don't, don't send all the guys. We just need a, a small amount of people. We'll, we'll take the city. And it tells us they were confident in themselves. It actually tells us they didn't even pray. And it says they were defeated. In fact, 36 men lost their lives. So, you know, we need to be careful. So this was a monumental task, all these people. By the way, um, the tribe of Levi, as I mentioned, is not mentioned in this census. Yet you have 12 tribes. How is he have 12 tribes, but Levi isn't mentioned? Well, Joseph, remember, got a double portion. Ephraim and Manasseh become a tribe. 
So what are the Levites? Well, verse 49, only of the tribe of Levi shall, Levi shall not take number nor take a census of them among the children of Israel. They're going to get a census in chapter 3. But he doesn't include them in this military census, right? Why? Verse 50, you shall appoint the Levites over the tabernacle of the testimony, over its furnishings. Verse 51, the Levites shall take it down and set up the tabernacle. So they're going to be associated with the things of the tabernacle, not war. The children of Israel shall pitch their tents, verse 52, everyone by his own camp, everyone by his own standard, according to their families. But the Levites shall camp around the testimony. So God didn't want them going to war. They were going to be taking care of the holy things of God. So they camped around it. So uh, you have the majority of the group involved in warfare, and then you had the Levites associated with the worship. But I just want to encourage you to know that both are important in the believer's life. Warfare and worship. It's part of our life. You're at war every single day. I'm, at, I'm in spiritual war all day long. And I need to be in worship all day long. There's a great verse in the Psalms, and maybe you've never read it before, but it speaks of both of these. In Psalm 149 and verse 6, it says this, Let the high praises of God be in our mouth, and the two-edged sword be in our hand. That's great. Warfare and worship. Now, here God lays out how He wanted each tribe to arrange themselves around the tabernacle, and that's what we're going to be seeing here. And what we're going to see is that the tabernacle was going to be in the center of the camp, and all those involved, well, first then the Levites for worship, and then those in warfare all around it. But, the, but the, understand the tabernacle was the centerpiece of God's people, and I think that's good to remind ourselves. Remember Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So we're going to come to chapter 2 and we're going to see this. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, every one of the children of Israel shall camp by his own standard besides the emblems of his father's house. They shall camp some distance from the tabernacle of meeting. So first of all, the tabernacle will be in the center of the Levites and then the people a little bit distance from them. But notice each had a standard and an emblem. A standard is a banner. Uh, the emblem was usually a picture often that of an animal that represented each tribe. Um, tradition actually gives us some information concerning these emblems. And uh, we also believe that the banners for each tribe was a different color, most likely coinciding with the color that was on the breastplate of the high priest. Remember, there were 12 different colored stones. So all these banners would have been a different color with a different emblem. Notice also, we're told at the end of verse 2, that they were keeping a distance from the tabernacle. This is because God wanted to be regarded as holy. He didn't ever want them just strolling in like, you know, being irreverent, but always setting God apart, reverence for his presence. Now, moving on, we have the various assignments here where each tribe was to camp when they settled into a campsite. And uh, I've put a, we'll put up a picture for you. Uh, since the tabernacle was on the east end, or the entrance, I should say, that's where it kind of begins in order right here. Notice verse 3, and you've got a little picture here. It's where the camp was. On the east side towards the rising of the sun, those of the standard of the forces with Judah shall camp according to their armies. And you have Nashon, the son of, son of Abimadad, would be the leader of Judah. We're told that his army in verse 4 was 74,600. And, and then you get down to uh, the camp of Issachar in verse 5. And the number of his uh, camp, 54,400 in verse 6. Then verse 7, you have the tribe of Zebulun. And so all of those three combined were uh, 186,400, verse 9. These shall break camp first. So it shows us how, if they went to war, how they would break camp. By the way, and this is just a footnote, the standard for Judah, or the emblem, I should say, was that of a lion. Was that of a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. That was their emblem. Then in verse 10, on the south side, now you move to the south, and uh, the standard of the forces with Reuben. And we're told in verse 11 how many were with them. Verse 12, you have Simeon. And then in verse 14, you have the tribe of Gap, Gad. And then all of their number uh, are told in verse 16 of how many there were, 151,450. Second to break camp. Then if they broke camp, it wasn't the next army, but it was actually the tabernacle. The tabernacle, the Levites. So verse 17, and the tabernacle meeting shall move out 
with the camp of the Levites in the middle of the camps as they camp, so they shall move out everyone in his place by their standards. Then you go to the west. Verse 18, on the west side you have Ephraim, and then verse 20, Manasseh, and verse 22, Benjamin. By the way, the banner of Ephraim was an ox, an ox. By the way, the banner of Reuben was a man. So you getting a, you have a, a lion, a man, and an ox. Those were the, the main three standards. And then there was a fourth one, the north side. The last three tribes would be the last to break camp. In verse 25, you have Dan. Verse 27, you have Asher. Verse 29, Naphtali. And the standard uh, for Dan, who was the head, was an eagle. So just something to kind of tuck away. Now, verse 32, these are the ones who were numbered with the children of Israel by their father's houses, all who were numbered according to their families and forces. Here it is, 603,550. But the Levites, were told, were not numbered amongst the children of Israel for war, right? Just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, just a couple of observations then as we, we look at this, these numbers. First of all, the groups that took up the lead and the rear guard were the largest of the groups, right? The lead group, which was headed by Judah, is 186,400,000. Uh, the rear guard is 157,600. So though God is their ultimate protector, God was also using common sense militarily. The biggest group of men of war in the front and the second biggest in the back to protect uh, the tabernacle. Secondly, if you show the arrangement of this campment, with the east side being at the bottom, which is how you come in the tabernacle. Well, let's put up the next pick, if you would. If you look at the numbers proportionally, can you see that? I don't know if you see that, but it makes the shape of a cross. You see that? Kind of interesting. The east side being the longest, the west side being the shortest, and the north and south being equals in distance. A coincidence? I don't think so at all. I don't think so at all. I believe that's exactly what God wanted them to see across as they went out. Then thirdly, we'd simply note that in this chapter, just another thing to mention is that God's highly organized. Do you see that? I mean, we read exactly how many there are, exactly where God wants them to go, exactly how he wants to break camp and so forth. First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 20, God says, let all things be done decently and in order. That's exactly what we have here. God is a God of order. In Psalm 147 and verse four, it says, God counts all the stars. Jesus said in Matthew 10, I know every single hair in your head. I like David Guzik who said, nothing is accomplished in God's kingdom without order and organization. In fact, the Bible tells us that Satan is the author of confusion. When God works, he always has a plan. He always has a plan. He always has a purpose. Now, God can work through chaos and God can even take evil and use it for good. But I'll tell you what, when he operates... He's always going to be organized. Now, on the flip side of that, we don't want to take the dangerous approach, though, and say, well, God's church should be highly organized in a sense that we just organize the Holy Spirit right out. Not at all. In fact, I don't even like referring to the church as an organization because it's not. It's an organism. It's alive. It's living. It's the bride of Christ. And we need to always be open to the ways the Holy Spirit wants to lead us. But when he does lead us in another direction, it'll always be in order. It'll always have a plan. It will never be. The Holy Spirit never leads you in a way of confusion. And then something I already told you to tuck away. Remember I said those different animals? You know, you have the lion, the man, the ox, and the eagle. It's interesting, but we see living creatures or angels found throughout the scriptures in the Old Testament book of Daniel and some places, as well as in the book of Revelation. And we see these same des descriptions. Revelation 4, 7, the first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third one like a man, and the fourth one like an eagle. Coincidence? I don't think so. What does that all mean? I'm not so sure, but I find it to be interesting. That's all. Finally, I would say this, as you would look at this encampment, and I wish that this was, was more in full color, because I think that we would see how beautiful the camp of God really was. Because you would have a different emblem, you would have a different color of a banner, you would have the people wearing different clothing. At night, the inside of the camp would be illuminated by the Shekinah glory of God. 
it would be an absolutely beautiful sight. In fact, when we get later in chapter 24 in verse 5, the prophet, prophet Balaam describes the encampment of God. And he says this, How lovely are your tents, O Jacob. How lovely are your dwellings, O Israel. They're like the valley stretched out, like gardens by the riverside. What an incredible sight it must have been. Now, I've been to Israel many times and I've seen people dressed very colorfully and dancing and singing the Lord. It's very beautiful. I can only imagine that time, you know, where you have three million and God's glory in the center. Must have been awesome. Now, we come to chapter three and we have the other part of the census and that is of the Levites. Having numbered those for war, now you have those numbered for worship. Now, these are the records of Aaron and Moses when the Lord spoke with Moses on Mount Sinai. And these are the names of the sons of Aaron, Nadab, firstborn, Abihu, Eleazar, and Ithamar. So Aaron had four sons. These are the names of the sons of Aaron, the anointed priests who consecrated to minister as priests. However... If you remember the story, verse 4, Nadab and Abihu had died before the Lord when they offered profane fire before the Lord in the wilderness of Sinai. We saw that in our last book, Leviticus chapter 10. God said that only the high priest can offer up the incense and go into the holy place. But Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's two sons, it tells us in another passage that they were drinking. And so maybe their sense is not on spot. They come into God's presence. They do their own thing. They offer up profane fire from God. And God just brings fire from heaven and consumes them. It's a radical scene. Pretty radical. So they, they were gone. So Eleazar and Ithamar, verse 4, ministered as priests in the presence of Aaron, their father. Later, when Aaron dies, then the older of those two would be Eleazar, would become the next priest. We're going to see that in Numbers chapter 20. Now understand, not just the high priest, but all priests, all the priests had to be descendants of Aaron, right? So the priests were a very small group within all of the Levites. So what did the rest of the Levites do? They made jeans. No, they didn't. Um, They essentially, I know these things just come to me up here. I'm sorry. They essentially helped the priest. Verse 5, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, bring the tribe of Levi near and present them before Aaron the priest that they may serve him and that they shall attend to his need. And then, of course, the needs to the congregation. So the Levites, then all the rest of them were to there to assist the priests. How can we help you? And in doing so, uh, assist then the rest of the congregation. Verse 8, they attend to the furnishings of the tabernacle, the needs of the children of Israel. Verse 9, and you shall give Levites to Aaron, his sons, and they are given entirely to him from among the children of Israel. So shall appoint Aaron and his sons, and they shall attend to their priesthood. But the outsider who comes near shall be put to death. Now, the outsider in context is not just some random person, but it's referring to a Levite. A Levite is not allowed to be a priest, only if he comes through the line of Aaron, you see. So that was very, very important. Being a priest, understand this, was a very high-profile job. The high priest was, of course, the highest-profile job. But it would be a tendency, even amongst the Levites themselves, to think, I could be a priest. I mean, I'm still, we're still kind of blood here. And they could presume to say, well, I can do that. So God says, no, don't let anybody else presume to be a priest outside of being related to Aaron. Now, later on, this happens. It actually happens in chapter 16 and verse 1. We read of Korah. He was a Levite and Datham and Abiram. And they all gathered together and they said, hey, Moses, what makes you so special? And you, Aaron. So they gathered against Moses and Aaron and said, you take too much upon yourselves. All the congregation is holy. Every one of them. The Lord is with them all. In other words, hey, you're nothing special. We're all special to God. And uh, so Moses said, okay, this is not good. So here's what we're going to do. Anybody on Moses and Aaron's side, y'all gather over here. All you guys that want to be with Kor and Dathan, y'all, y'all gather over there. And uh, we'll just see who, who, is, who God is behind, you know. And we read in verse 32 of that chapter, the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the households of the men of Korah, all their goods, and everyone with them. Pretty radical, right? So God is very serious, and that's why he says there that only Aaron and his sons alone are to be 
the priests. The Levites assist them. Now, in verses 11 through 13, we read why God set apart a whole tribe to serve him. Here's why. Why the whole tribe of Levi? Here's why. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Now behold, I myself have taken the Levites from among the children of Israel. They're, this is the special tribe. They can't do go to war. They're going to attend to me, do all this work. Why? Instead of every firstborn who opens the womb among the children of Israel. Therefore, the Levites shall be mine. Because of all the firstborn are mine. On the day that I struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, I sanctified to myself all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast. They shall be mine. I am the Lord. So because God spared the firstborn from the angel of death in Egypt, God says, all of the firstborn males are mine. And they must be given to me, whether human or animal. They must be redeemed by sacrifice. And so the firstborn of animals, as we know, were sacrificed to God. Then all of the male children that were born were to be dedicated now in service to God. However, God said, and rather, instead of taking every single male, first male in every single home in service to me, I will take all of the Levites in their stead. So the Levites then became the servants to the priests and substitutes for the firstborn in Israel. So the whole tribe of Levi. Verse 14, then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai, saying, now number the children of Israel by their father's houses, by their families. You shall number every male... Notice this, from a month old and above. So there's a, we're going to see there's going to be another distinction later on. But this is from a month old and above. And Moses numbered them according to the word of the Lord, as he was commanded. These were the sons of Levi by their names. And so you can call this section my three sons, because there were three. Gershon, Kohath, and Mary. I'm just saying, my three sons. For those of you who are younger, you have no idea what that means. So forget about it. And these are the names of the sons of Gershon by their families. And verse 19, the sons of Koath. And verse 20, the sons of Merai. Now, from Gershon, we're told in verses 21 to 22, there were 7,500 males. Verse 23, the Gershonites were to camp behind the tabernacle westward. And uh, the Gershonites essentially took care of the soft stuff for the tabernacle. And, and we're going to talk about the responsibilities in a little, little bit. Um, Verse 27, from Kohath. And then you have these families that came from Kohath. In verse 28, there were 8,600 keeping charge of the sanctuary. They camped on the south side. And uh, we read that they were the ones taking care of the holy articles, the furnishings. We'll look at that in a bit. Then in verse 33, from Marii. Here you have the families of Marii. They were 600, uh, or sorry, 6,200, verse 35. And they camped on the north side of the sanctuary. And we're going to see that they took care of the infrastructure, the boards, the poles of the sanctuary. So all these families, these three families camped, notice, north, south, and west. The question is, what about the east entrance? Which, by the way, was the only way into the tabernacle, right? Well, verse 38. Moreover, those who were to camp before the tabernacle east, before the tabernacle meet, were Moses, Aaron, as his sons, keeping the charge of the sanctuary. So the Levites surrounded the tabernacle, and the priests then were right there guarding the very entrance of it. So, verse 39, all were numbered among the Levites, whom Moses and Aaron numbered at the commandment of the Lord by their families, all the males, from a month old and above, were 22,000. So all the males were numbered. Next, he numbered all the firstborn males of all Israel. So now we got to number all the firstborn males of all Israel. Again, the Levites were to be instead of all the firstborn males in the whole tribe. So God numbered them, verse 40. And the Lord said to Moses, the number of all the firstborn males of the children of Israel from one month old and above, and take the number of their names. And you shall take the Levites for me, I'm the Lord, instead of the firstborn among the children of Israel and the livestock of the Levites instead of all the firstborn of the livestock of the children of Israel. So Moses numbered all the firstborn among the children of Israel as the Lord commanded. And all the firstborn males, according to the number of the names from a month old and above, of those who were numbered were 22,273. So I don't know if you see there's a discrepancy here. There, there actually is. There's actually 273 more firstborn males among all the tribe of Israel than all the firstborn among the the, the Levites, or each Levite, I should say. So, verse 4, the Lord said to Moses, saying, 
take the Levites instead of all the firstborn among the children of Israel and the livestock instead of their livestock. The Levites shall be mine. I'm the Lord. And for the redemption of the 273 of the firstborn of the children of Israel, who are more than the number of the Levites, you shall take five shekels for each one individually. You shall take them in the currency of the shekel of the sanctuary, the shekel of 20 gerars. So it's pretty amazing. God, God doesn't say, well, that's pretty close enough. That's good. Isn't that funny? I mean, God is like serious down to the very thing. God will not be shortchanged. So he says the 273 over, uh, they got to be redeemed with money. We got to make it right. And with the money, what do you do? Well, you give the excess uh, to Aaron and the sons in verse 48. And then in verse 51, we read, Moses gave the redemption money to Aaron and his sons according to the word of the Lord as the Lord commanded Moses. So you have all these unique, interesting details, right? Now, we have one more chapter we want to look at, and we have another census in regard to the Levites. Why is that? Well, this is to determine who will then work in the sanctuary. The first census of the Levites, which we just saw in the last chapter, was to determine how many males there were a month older and above in order to redeem the firstborn of Israel. But it's obvious a one-month-old baby can't serve as, you know, in the tabernacle area. So now you have another census taken of those who are of age now to work in the tabernacle. So uh, hopefully you're following. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, take a census now of the sons of Kohath among the children of Levi by their families, by their father's house, from 30 years old and above, even to 50 years old, all who enter the service to do the work of the tabernacle of meeting. So first of all, kind of notice this. The Levites only served 20 years, just 20 years, right? From the prime of life, 30 years old until 50. When you reach 50, you retired. I thought when I first read that first couple of times, and I, of course I studied this, and I thought, man, I'd like to be a Levite. <laughs> 50 years old, man, I'm retired. This is awesome. That's great. Why so early? Well, think of carrying all this heavy material much of it overlaid with gold. It's very heavy. And you're in the wilderness. And you're charting it around year after year. And there ain't no air conditioning. <laughs> right? So I'm beginning to think, I don't know if I want that job. Probably at the age of 50, you look like you're 85. Right? You're all shriveled up and tired. And your bones are ready to break. So you're like, hey, it ain't so great. It ain't so glamorous. Now, there is an interesting footnote that I would have. We, you, you'd probably miss it, but I want to bring it up nonetheless. When we get to chapter 8 and verse 24, we are told that the Levites began their service at the age of 25. And yet here we're told 30. So what we believe through the, uh, the Torah and the Mishnah is that they were employed actually at 25 years old. But there was a five-year training period. For five years, they're training. And then officially, they begin at 30 years old. Interesting, of course, Jesus began his ministry at what? 30 years old. So, but you would have that training period for five years. Why? Make sure you don't mess up because when you mess up concerning the things of the tabernacle, you die. So that was kind of like your apprenticeship. Don't mess up, son. You might be gone. Now, the actual census of the three sons of Levi doesn't take place to uh, actually verse 34. So what we have in the first part of this chapter is a detailed description of their duties, okay? So beginning in verse 4 all the way to verse 20, you have the duties of the Kohathites. Um, this is the service of the sons of the Kohath in verse 4 in the tabernacle of meeting relating to the most holy things. The Kohathites took care of the holy furnishings. In verse 5, the covering the veil. Uh, and the cover of the ark of the testimony with it. So understand this, that when they carried the ark in the wilderness, it wasn't exposed. It was actually covered with coverings. Verse 6 tells us they should put on a covering of badger skins and pray, uh, spread over it a cloth entirely of blue, and then they shall insert its poles. Remember, we saw in the book of Leviticus when this was made, there would be rings on the side of the, of the ark of the covenant as well as the other furnishings, and poles would be inserted in it so that they would carry it on their shoulders. Later on, we know in 2 Samuel chapter 6 that David is bringing back the ark to Jerusalem and he doesn't do that. He actually puts it on a cart to get it there faster and it was heavy. And while it's on this cart, there's two men on it and it kind of hits a bump and with the, the ox and one of the guys tries to steady it so it doesn't fall and God smites him immediately. That was Uzziah. 
And of course, David was overwhelmed by that. He couldn't believe it. He stopped right there. And there was like a three-month period. And obviously, he went to God's word and realized it needs to come on poles. And so later on, we see him bringing it on. <laughs> Levites carrying it on their, their shoulders and doing it the right way. But God was concerned about how it was transported. But this was the job of the, the Kohathites. They would carry the heavy furniture. In verses 21 to 28, you have the responsibility of the Gershonites. Uh, verse 25, they carried the curtains of the tabernacle, uh, the covering of the badger skins, the screen of the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Uh, in verse 26, the screen for the door of the gate of the court, the hangings in the court, uh, all around the tabernacle and the altar. And so they essentially took care of uh, all the fabrics and things like that and some of the framework. So actually when we get to chapter 7, they were actually given two carts to actually carry some of the heavier materials. And then in verses 29 through 33, we have the responsibility of the Marites. And uh, they're responsible for the real infrastructure. In verse 31, the bars, the pillars, the sockets... Um, verse 32, the pillars around the court and their sockets, the pegs, the cords, all their furnishing. And so all of the heavier items. Uh, theirs was a greater task. So when we get to chapter 7, they're actually given four carts to transport this heavy material. And by the way, it was most likely one of these carts that David used to transport the Ark of the Covenant in the book of Samuel, of which, of course, God judged him for that. Verse 33, this is the service of the families of the sons of Mary, all their service. So here you have the responsibilities of each member within the tribe of, of Levi. Now keep in mind, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of Levites. So all of these guys are working like ants when the tabernacle is taken apart, right? Probably one guy had one post over in the north side. One guy had one of the, a couple pegs over on the east side. One guy did this and they just did their task and all took this whole thing together, transported and put it back together. But each person here, each Levite had a specific job to do in the sanctuary. And, and as I was thinking about it, I was like, you know, that's exactly like the body of Christ, right? Every person within the body of Christ has a task, has a giftedness, has that which God wants them to do. I know very often people say, you know, Pastor Ron, I don't have a gift. I don't know or I don't know what it is. Well, first of all, you do have one or gifts. First Corinthians 12, 7 says the manifestation of the Holy Spirit is given to each one, every one of us for the profit of all. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says, each one has received a gift. And because you have that gift, you need to minister it one to another. So it is our job to find out what our giftedness is, right? And then to use it. Now, if you don't know what your gifts are, your abilities are, you're never going to find out doing nothing. <laughs> no one ever found out what their gifts were without doing something for the kingdom of God. But I have found that as you just step out and serve, maybe it's going on a missions trip or maybe it's serving in children's church or it's being at church and helping. You know, it's just as you're involved wanting to make yourself available to the Lord or serving the Lord, God, he manifests gifts. He'll also show you what you're not called to do too. I know things that I'm not called to do. That's for sure. So sometimes it's a process of elimination. That's okay too, right? But... You'll never know unless you get in the ball game. I mean, think about it. The, for me, the easiest analogy is, you know, playing Little League Baseball, you know, or playing baseball in and of itself. You're never going to know what your position is if you sit on the bench and collect splinters, right? Get in the game. Get in the game. And as you're involved in the game, you're going to find out, am I good at second base? Am I, am I a pitcher? Am I a catcher? Am I an outfielder? Who, who, what, what do I do? You know, God will direct you. And then once you know what your giftedness is, then, of course, you need to use it, as it says in Peter, as each one has received a gift, serve it or minister one to another. I think far, far too often people are not using their giftedness, you know. Can you imagine if all these people that were all had their certain assignments for all the different breakdown of the tabernacle and one guy's just saying, you know, man, I'm just going to sleep in this Sunday <laughs> or whenever it was when they were transporting. And there goes the, the pillar of fire has been taken off or the clouds. We got to go follow God today. And he decides, you know what? I'm just not going to get that one pillar. I just, man, I'm pooped. You know, so they try to start setting up the tabernacle in the next place, and it's kind of, the tent on the side is kind of hanging down like that. And it says, what's going on? Oh, you know, Moises over there, he forgot, he forgot to bring the pole. He didn't want to do it. Really? Why? I don't know. He was just tired. He wanted to sleep in, you know, kind of a thing. Can you imagine? 
It looked like, terrible. You'd have this picture of the tabernacle, but it's all tweaked down in one spot. Why is that? Moises, you know, he just didn't want to come. I, I was tired. I didn't want to come. Forget about it. You know, whatever. So you get the point, right? I mean, all of us have been gifted. All of us are important. You know, maybe you're just the peg. That's okay. That's an, your important peg. You know, I'm just the pillar. I'm just whatever. We're all parts and we are interdependent of one another. We are really interdependent of one another. And, and I'm blessed by you. And hopefully you're blessed by me and we're blessed by one another. But we have to, we have to serve. We have to be involved. So anyway, each one had an important role. Now, in the rest of this chapter, we have the actual sentence of, census of those numbered or qualified to do the work. In verses 34 through 37, we have the number of the Kohathites. There was 2,750 of them. The Gershonites, in verses 38 to 41, there was uh, 2,630 of them. And in verses 42 and 44, the Marites, 3,200 of them. So there were 8,580 in all. And verse 49 ends, according to the commandment of the Lord, they were numbered by the hand of Moses, each according to his service and according to his task. Thus they were numbered by him as the Lord commanded Moses. So again, numbers are very important to God. I mean, you see, numbers, see, he numbered how many men, there were men for a war, how many men for service, how many uh, guys there were for each little task they did. God is a God of order, not a God of chaos. And, and he wants us all involved for him in service to him. So let me close with this. Um, Richard Steele had just, a, I thought it was a good quote regarding our service and how we are serving. He wrote this, we should employ our passions. We should employ our passions in the service of life for God, not spend life in the service of our passions. Let me read that again. We should employ our passions in the service of life for God, not spend life in the service for our passions. So many times it's all about me. I'm doing it for me. I'm doing this for me. And what about me? What do you got for me? Hey, that's the United States, isn't it? And that very often is what the church in the United States look like. So about me, what do you got for me? What are you doing for me? I'm employing it all for my passions. But instead, I should be employing all my passions and everything I have for the Lord. And when I do, he gets the glory and I get blessed. That's the blessed life. So we're not just the number when it comes to God, right? We really aren't. Every single one of us are important. God wants to employ the gifts and the talents that he has. And when we do, what a blessing. What a blessing. Well, next week we'll go into chapter five, but let's, let's stop right here. Let's pray.